And as you get into that group, you explain, you, you simply listen. And you don't listen to respond. That's the important thing to remember. You listen to learn why they feel the way they do, right? And that's what I did. For 20 minutes, they all explained to me how they've grown up around guns, and I have too. My dad's a gun owner, and I've cleaned and used his gun multiple times. Um, I, I understand part of that culture because my dad's former law enforcement, so I explained that to them. And then I, I listened to the other things that they talked about, like uh, about um, their guns and why they feel the need to use them and how they're part of their culture and how they don't want to have their guns taken away. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm just going to add my own words of welcome, and uh, then our main guest for the evening will be joining us. Uh, my name is David Leonard. Tonight's conversation is the fourth in our new series entitled The Public Conversation, where we engage in discussion regarding issues of the day with notable public figures, artists, thinkers, and activists. This series, as you know, is being written, underwritten by Bank of America, and we're thankful for their support, as well as for the support of WGBH in live streaming tonight's conversation through the Forum Network. Our format this evening will be to start with some opening words from my guest, followed by some one-on-one -on -one conversation drawing from my own questions, and then we'll be drawing from the questions that were collected from many of you um, as you waited in line this evening. So my guest this evening is David Hogg, survivor of the Parkland, Florida mass shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Tragedy where 17 individuals lost their lives in February of this year. In the eighth months since, David, along with his sister Lauren, have published a book. He and a group of like-minded individuals started an organization, traveled across the U.S., and became a voice, if not the voice, at the intersection of responsible gun safety advocacy, voter registration, and the youth voice in local and national politics. He has become a recognizable public figure as a result of this work. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, David Hogg. So first off, I want to thank the Boston Public Library for having me here to speak today. Um, and, and second off, I, want, I, I, I hope that everybody realizes that none of us should be here right now. When politicians go out there and they say that this discussion should not be happening right now, and the time is not now to have this discussion. They're right. This conversation should have been had centuries ago, decades ago, when we could have solved this issue, when our parents could have solved this issue. But sadly, they hadn't, because they couldn't stand up to this senseless violence. But now we are. And we can change it, and we will. Um, this summer, I embarked on a 63-day bus tour across the country with gun violence prevention activists from around the country, from all different communities, because as March for Our Lives, as an organization, we understand that the validity of your violence that you face in your community or the issue that you face should not and cannot be determined by your zip code, color of your skin, or your sex or sexual orientation, or, or even nationality. Because we recognize that the only, that the only, the people that are affected by gun violence is not anyone's subgroup, it's, it's humans. And we have to work together, not as Americans, not just as, uh, different communities, but as human beings to solve this issue. Um, when I'm up at these things, I think to myself a lot of the time, what can I say that will have the most impact on anybody? And honestly, I don't know, because this issue has been happening for so long. This issue has been here for centuries. When we talk about mass shootings, one thing that is rarely brought up is the fact that mass shootings is a century-old problem. One of the first mass shootings in American history is the Battle of Wounded Knee, where over 100 Native Americans were slaughtered by the United States government. And we don't talk about that. We don't talk about the thousands of indigenous peoples that were murdered and killed uh, during what we call Manifest Destiny, but what many indigenous people and many Americans now know as genocide. Um, but we have to start to recognize that to be able to change that and recognize that past to be able to change the future, right? Uh, and the only way that we can do that is by standing up in our own communities and putting down the futility that we face. Futility being the belief that we can't that one individual or one person can't make the change, can't make change, and we can. On February 14th, me and my friends weren't all of a sudden empowered. We weren't given a ton of power. What, what happened is we realized that we've always had this power. We realized that we had this power to create this change in our community, and that's what I hope you guys realize. Power does not lie in any single individual. Power lies in one individual, and that's you. You have to recognize that the issues in your community even the issues that aren't being talked about right now are going to have to be taken on by future generations if you don't stand up to end them now. Whether it be gun violence, prevention, or climate change, 
or immigration or racism or discrimination or policies that actively and dispro disproportionately affect poorer people and people of color across this country, right? What scares me the most when I'm talking about these things is the fact that I'm talking about gun violence prevention and by acknowledging that problem, we can solve it. But what scares me is the problems that we're not talking about right now. Like the millions of undocumented people that face a massive amount of gun violence that goes unreported because many times people that in the undocumented community are afraid to go and get treated if they're shot because they're worried that they're gonna be deported. Many of the people that I've talked to on the west side of Chicago, like my friend Alex King and others, have described what their undocumented friends face from all different countries, not just Central America and South America, but from the Philippines, from Asia, from Europe, and different places. Uh, and, and what they talked about is how in these different communities where they're undocumented, they fear the government and ICE so much, it's gotten to the point where if you're shot, you oftentimes will do everything in your power not to go to the hospital. Because what happens is individuals will go to the hospital, and when it's found that they're undocumented, within two to three days, ICE shows up in unmarked cars and unmarked clothing, will go and break down their door and deport them and their families, even though this may be the only place that they've ever known. We have a responsibility to fight for those people. As an American people, we have to recognize that being American is not just in your nationality, but it's what you believe in as an, as an individual. It's what you believe in as a person fighting for change, fighting for the belief that you can make change in the world no matter where you are. We have millions of people that are Americans living overseas, and we have millions of people that are not Americans living in America right now. And we have to recognize the fact that we are, we are of one collective society that is living on stolen land. So how, who are we to say that anybody is illegal on stolen land, yeah. right? Yeah. Who are we to say? Who are we to say that your? Who are we to say that your violence doesn't matter because of the five digits in your zip code or the number of figures in your bank account? We should come together as a collective society and recognize that no matter where you come from, who you are, how much you make, or what the color of your skin is. The violence you face is unacceptable and we must face it together because solving violence in one community will not solve violence in any community. Because violence is an issue that we have to face everywhere and take down everywhere. Just like injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And we have to work together to solve those issues. We have to fight for those that no longer can. Whether it be the transgender women that are disproportionately murdered and affected by gun violence in the United States that goes unreported as hate crimes because they, they get misgendered by local media, their local police department, and even their family members who refuse to even accept that they're trans. Or whether it be the undocumented people that are crossing the border and get murdered by Customs and Border Patrol that never get reported because they get murdered in the middle of nowhere, which there are, there are many instances of. Or when we're talking about self-defense gun use, we have to remember the stories that we don't hear that are where they talk about self-defense gun use, but they refuse to acknowledge the fact that thousands of children every decade are murdered by their parents because they are mistaken for an intruder. One of those children was a young girl that was seven years old living in Dallas, Texas. One night she was hiding and uh, was hiding trying to surprise her father when she came home or, or when, his, when her father came home from work. She was hiding in the closet in the main hallway. The father came home and the girl jumped out and surprised her father and he shot and killed her on the spot. She was seven years old. She died in his arms and said, Daddy, I love you. Those are the stories we don't hear about when we're talking about self-defense gun use. We don't hear about the fact that when we're talking about mental health, in reality, we're only talking about mental health in white communities. Because if you're a white person that goes out and commits these acts, it's mental health. But if, you, if you're a person with, of Middle Eastern descent, you're a terrorist. If you're a black person, you're a criminal. If you're, if you're from Central America or South America, or you're a brown person in general, you're considered an illegal immigrant even if you've lived here your entire life, which is bullshit, right? As a society, we must recognize the fact that mental illness is something that we do have to face, but disproportionately, people that are afflicted with, with mental illness are the victims of gun violence and not the people perpetrating it. Addressing gun violence as people that are purely violent is only going to worsen the stigmatization around mental health in this country. That is only going to get worse. Because when we, when we talk about gun violence, we also have to include the fact that there is a mental health aspect, but we rarely talk about the fact that a majority of gun deaths, over two thirds, are suicides that disproportionately affect communities across America that we don't talk about. Because we don't like talking about the fact that people are sad. We don't like talking about and asking for help because we stigmatize that in our country. Because if you reach out for help, it doesn't make you a stronger person, it makes you weak. 
And we can't accept that anymore because reaching out for help is what a strong person does. Reaching out and asking a friend for help when you need it is how you become a stronger person. It's how you enable and change your community for the better, whether that be your community or just the community of America or the world. And lastly, we have to recognize that the only way that we are going to be able to stand up for all these individuals from the undocumented peoples in El Paso or West Chicago to the native indigenous peoples that can't vote in North Dakota because now there's a voter ID law that says that a PO box doesn't count as an address. We have to represent those people. We have to represent the trans people that are murdered in hate crimes that go unreported and elect morally just leaders that aren't Democrats or Republicans, but are Americans that represent us and the American interests and the future of this country and not special interests. We have to work together to create that society. The only way we're ever gonna be able to do it though is by working on political campaigns, running for office, and voting, not just the, in this election, but in every election, and realizing it's not gonna be any one individual like Barack Obama or anybody else that comes out and saves our society. The only person that's going to save our society and make it a better society is one person and one person only, you, with your vote. So go out and vote. Thank you guys. Um, so I, that's, that's quite an opening um, set of thoughts to share with us. I think we've got a lot to get through, yes. uh, a lot of heavy topics. Um, but if you don't mind, I'd like to start with a little bit about yourself. Um, I, I enjoyed reading the book, Never Again. It, it gave me some insights. Uh, obviously, it tells the story in a particular way. Um, would you mind taking us back to what life was like before February 14th? Sure. Um, I was a socially awkward walking hormone, and still kind of am, um, uh, that was in high school and had no clue what to do with my life. My pastimes included hydroponics, astronomy, uh, documentary filmmaking, and uh, studying um, like just astrophotography. I had a project with my friends where we were trying to find secret government satellites. Um, that uh, that might still come in useful, right? Yeah. Um, that were in geosynchronous orbit because there was um, there were a couple of satellite launches that weren't reported as fails that we didn't think were. And it was, like a, it was just a small thing that me and my friends in astronomy club were interested in. So we, we uh, came up with this process, or we didn't come up with it, but we learned of it, I forget how. We're using long-term exposure photography, stars, because the rotation of the planet will leave streaks, but satellites in geosynchronous orbit will stay as single points in the sky. So we were figuring maybe we could cross-reference that with known satellites and find the ones that um, were either defunct and believed to have failed or were actually still there and were, had failed. Um, and that was one thing I was doing. Um, and I was also just interested in uh, hydroponics and aquaponics because I wanted to be an aerospace engineer and get humans to um, Mars. Um, by working with SpaceX or like a different aerospace company um, to get us there to advance humanity for the better so that the future uh, of this country could be multi-planetary um, or at least the future of humanity could be multi-planetary so that um, if we did uh, currently, as we are right now currently uh, destroying Earth, uh, maybe we would have another planet that we hopefully wouldn't destroy. Um, but yeah, that's what I was interested in working on. And, and what was family life like growing up? You, you started on the West Coast, moved to the yeah. East Coast? Uh, I, lived in Los Ange I lived in a city called Torrance, California until I was 14 years old. My dad was, my dad was a, an FBI agent and my mom was a uh, first grade elementary school teacher and still is to this day. Um, and yeah, I, I grew up in a, I mean, I would say a pretty traditional family household where um, my dad was incredibly hardworking. I still take a massive amount of inspiration from how much he poured into his work trying to make, uh, from serving his country in the United States Navy to um, going out and working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, just making sure that Americans were safe because he was an FBI agent uh, at the time. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I hung out with my sister and we would um, go to school and not really worry about anything. We just rode around on our, like, I would ride around on my bike and go mountain biking all the time and didn't really have a care in the world for what I was, I only cared about myself and only what I was experiencing and never really cared about anyone else, as shitty as that sounds. Um, uh, but that all changed on February 14th when for the first time, um, I, I never knew what it felt like to feel somebody else's pain because like I had never experienced that amount of suffering in my life that like knowing that somebody had like, like violently died in your school. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about the day itself? 
just so we, yeah. we understand what you took away from that? Um, so I was in school that day, and it was February 14th, Valentine's Day. It was a, it was a really nice day. Uh, it was really lovely, and um, I always vehemently like hated Valentine's Day because I was always single and had been rejected multiple times. Um, <laughs> And like everybody else seemed to be like in love at our school and like I was just there in love with science um, <laughs> and uh, just experimenting with that. So coincidentally that day, I, I started out the day, with the one thing that I did love um, working with and that was the hydroponic system at our school and working on maintaining that. I know I'm a huge nerd. Um, it's not uh, gonna give you chocolates probably, but. Yeah, um, <laughs> but we were, I just went out and worked on that the morning. The day went on as, it's, as it usually did. I went out and worked on our uh, observatory that we were building with astronomy club in my astronomy class. Uh, and then the next period I was in my AP environmental science class uh, learning about um, municipal waste, which I soon would learn is our government. Um, um, <laughs> but um, honestly. Um, Maybe we can come back to that part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I was out there and I was in my AP environmental science class just learning about garbage and um, <laughs> the door was open and uh, we hear a gun, like a, a pop go off and I look at my friend on my left and I'm like, hey, that kind of sounded like a gun try. He's like, yeah, it did. So we look back and we tell our teacher like, hey, you should like close the door in case there's like, an, like that, that was weird. But this- Cause you all grew up with drills and yeah, the experience I, of what to I, do. I thought it was a drill even until I like, up until I saw it on the news, like that there was a shooting at my school, I thought it was a drill with like blanks and like fake blood because our school had told us that there was going to be a drill. Like our teachers at least had told us that there was going to be a drill like with fake blood and blanks possibly like an active shooter drill. Um, but s sadly, this wasn't any drill. Um, but what happened is as I like left the classroom because the fire alarm started going off, uh, I... I essentially tried going to our evacuation zone calmly and then a, a, a flood of kids started running in the opposite direction of where I was going and they were actually running towards the freshman building but I didn't realize that at the time and I didn't know where the shooting was really occurring so I started running with them. Um, but as I was running towards the freshman building, I, I was luckily stopped by, I, I think a janitor, but I still have never seen this person again. Um, but like the, this person stopped me and like everybody else I was around and told us to go uh, not that way and luckily there was a teacher that opened her door and got about 60 students in our classroom in the matter of about 30 seconds. Um, and we stayed in there for a pretty solid amount of time, but around like 20, like 30 minutes later, we found out that it wasn't a drill. And that's when I took my phone out and like started recording, not knowing, like just thinking like, God forbid, if, if we do die here, um, hopefully like our boy, I, I felt a sense of responsibility. One is like a journalist at, and the news director of my school to capture the story and tell it. Um, and, and two, I felt a necessity I felt a necessity to um, keep myself calm in that situation because my father had always told my sister and I that if we were ever in, like, I, I don't know if uh, any of you guys that have family and law enforcement experience the same thing, but like my father would tell us like where the, like always look for the exits in buildings and like know where you're gonna go if there's like a, a shooter. Um, and like he always told us like, like the worst thing to be is afraid and scared uh, in any like crisis situation. So I took out my camera and did the most like uh, natural thing that I could think of, and that was interviewing people during the shooting. Um, and inadvertently, that could have, uh, my thinking was also that it maybe if we did die there, our voices would carry on through those stories. Uh, but luckily we made it out, uh, everybody in my classroom did, but 17 others didn't. And after I went home, uh, I, I turned in my, like the, those interviews to the newspaper I was working for at the time. And uh, I was, my sister finally got home after I did, uh, and she was crying so much uh, that like I had never, I had never felt I did I didn't. I, it took me several months to realize what had actually happened that day, uh, because I it was so hard for me to explain because I I felt like the emotions that I felt that day from my sister were more than I've ever been able to describe using my own language, and I like. Um, Essentially what happened is I, I had felt empathy. I had felt what she was actually feeling. She was crying so much that like it physically made me uncomfortable and I couldn't stand to be around her in the house. Um, so I did what I, the only thing I could think to do and that was speak for those that couldn't at the time like my sister about the topic um, because I knew about like the NRA before the shooting because of shows like Last Week Tonight and The Daily Show and also my experience in speech and debate arguing about universal background checks and digitalization of ATF records. 
Um, so I knew some background on it. So I decided to go out there and speak to as many people as I could at the time so that this wouldn't just be another mass shooting story that I'd constantly see. How, how quickly did your thinking get to the point where you felt you needed to do something um, about this situation as opposed to just sort of turn inward and just, just be at home? Pretty much as soon as I heard my sister crying. I, like, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't stand to be around my sister knowing that as her big brother for the first time in my life, there was nothing I could do to stop her from crying. How, how is she doing now? She's all right. A lot of the students at the school, um, the mental health uh, at the school, and, and like, I don't even like using the word mental health because like, that, like, that, that has a certain persona around it that stigmatizes a lot of people. Um, but the situation of caring, af caring for the mental state of the students at the school with therapists is very poor right now, even though they do have therapists. Some of the students that I've talked to even have had to like, like when the, the students have PTSD, like significant PTSD and anxiety orders, uh, almost even similar to people that have gone through war that have uh, seen gun violence themselves firsthand too. Um, and what happened is because the fire alarm was going off, that's a really big trigger for a lot of the students and we've had the fire alarm go off, I think over eight times now this year alone, because it was accidentally pulled or uh, something inadvertently happened that made the fire alarm go off. Uh, and the mental health professionals at the school will take two students at a time when they're both sobbing because they're overwhelmed. They don't have the resources that they need. The school's dras drastically underfunded on that part. And actually all schools are in general. The fact that we, we should not, as a society, and as individuals in school and with, if you're a parent with kids in school, we shouldn't accept the fact that there are more police officers in school than social workers. Because that's how you increase the school to prison pipeline, that's how you increase incarceration, and that's how you increase distrust between students and advisors. We need to create and culture a community of students and their advisors where it's almost, it, it's a sense of family where you, like they wanna help you and they don't wanna suppress you and they don't wanna just shove you through school because it's this thing that society expects you to do, but they want to give you, they don't wanna empower you because you've always had this power, but they wanna show you that you've always had this power. What, what educators should be doing is going out there and showing students that they've always had this power, not talking down to them. When I was like in, like just as an example, when I, when I was learning to read, it took me until like third grade to be able to read because I have dyslexia. And teachers would tell my parents, like, I'm never going to su succeed to be anything. And I know there's millions of children around the country that are taught that, like, every day. And that's not okay, because nobody should be taught that about themselves. And I was lucky enough to be able to succeed and be put in a school environment like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, which is one of the best schools in America in terms of high school, to empower myself to create this change and be able to speak to you right now. There are millions of children that are just as eloquent as I do and have even more stories than I do. That that don't follow that one dream or that one idea because their teachers tell them that they shouldn't and it's stupid because society expects you to do this. Fuck society. Like, go out and do what you want to do. If you, like, if you want to go out and you, you want to pursue aerospace engineering and get us to Mars, go out and do that. If you want to go out and chase your music career and you want to talk about politics through that, use whatever medium that you love most and pursue it and never let anyone tell you that you can't. Because that person that's telling you that they can't was told that too by somebody else before them, and that person was told that too by somebody else before them. Break the cycle. We can, we can empower young people to pursue any dream that they want and make them successful by showing that they can believe in themselves, that they can be successful. But we have to realize that. So part of this uh, um, must have started by finding others that you could build this group with or community with. Yeah. Um, because you, you're not doing this on your own, yeah. um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, how many days after, same day, next day, uh, uh, did that start to come together? Like two days after. Yeah. Uh, I was just constantly going on the news as much as I could, speaking about the issues, uh -huh. just for like those I couldn't at the time. Like the fact, the fact that there's still parents out there that like because they couldn't immediately stand up after the shooting because they had lost a child. Uh, their voice is not going to be heard nearly to the extent that it like would be, and that that's not okay. Like that, and that shows a lot of our media cycle. You know, not just about around mass shootings, but shootings in general. You know, like the fact that we treat, we need to treat mass shootings as airplane crashes in terms of storytelling, and not car crashes, right? We treat car crashes as something that's just inevitably going to happen, and it are essentially acts of God. One, they're not, and two. 
Shootings aren't either. Shootings are act of man. When people talk about law-abiding gun owners, an important thing to remember is the fact that the shooter at our school was a law-abiding gun owner. The shooter in Las Vegas was a law-abiding gun owner that didn't show any signs or any mental health issues beforehand. When we went and spoke to the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, and asked him what, like, if you just want to focus on mental health, that's great, but what do you plan to do to stop shooters like the one in Las Vegas that showed no previous warning signs? He looked at us point blank and said, I don't know. Those are not the leaders we need. We need leaders that have answers. <laughs> By the way, uh, this might not be shocking to you guys, but he's taken $3 million from the NRA, so, yeah. Is part of the problem that we become immune to these kind of um, yeah, situations? Absolutely. Tragedies? Um, I mean, 200 years ago, we were immune to the fact that like half of children died from preventable diseases before they were eight. And philosophers, there were multiple accounts of philosophers out there and like people that were big thinkers during the time, like big ideas, people that were saying like, we should just accept that. There's nothing we can do. But the people that made that change were the people that said no to society and said we can make this change and stood up to make it because they believed in themselves. And that's where the real power lies. It's believing in yourself and that you can make this change because you really can. It's not easy and it doesn't come today or tomorrow. And it comes through hard work, elbow grease, tears and blood, but you can make it happen. Yeah. So, as, you're me as you've been taking the message on the road, I, I mean, how, how, many, how many times have you spoken in the last eight months? How many cities? Uh, Any idea? No. No? No. no. Probably oh. like over 300. Yeah. Um, what's the reception like? Because if this is about changing the way people think, or the getting uh, you know, an antidote to this immunity that people feel when, when tragedies happen, um, what, what's the reaction like? Um, the reactions from people that already agree with us are great, obviously. Um, the, the reactions from people that don't are, I, I learned a lot about like the root causes of, um, the root cause of hatred in, the, in a lot of instances. I would say half of hatred is brought on by fear. And 100% of fear is brought on by a lack of education. Or at least 90% of fear. I'm still afraid of roller coasters. Um, <laughs> but, um, when I go out and speak to people, um, the way I think about it is when we're young kids, like we're afraid of the dark until we realize darkness is just the absence of a certain wavelength of photons, right? Uh, and, but we realize that there's no monsters there because of that. We realize that there's nothing to be afraid of through that education. And what our mission as activists or just as young people in this country or as people in general if we want to create this change, the only way we're ever going to be able to create it is through that education. And what I've done is like when there's people shouting my name saying like, where's that hog kid? Like, where is he? Shouting that in the middle of Dallas, Texas in 98 degree heat, yelling racial slurs outside of our event, trying to convince people not to come in. And they have 20 of them all loaded with AR-15s, multiple handguns and knives. Um, one, why do you need that many guns? Uh, but two, uh, what we did is we, I went out and did what any sensible person would do and spoke to the people that wanted to kill me. Um, and I, I learned a lot. And what I learned the most of is that people think that we're trying to take their guns away and we're not. The way, I, I hope that, if there's anything, I hope that you guys take two things away from this. And one is that voting is really important uh, and that's the only way that we're actually gonna be able to create movement on this, like, uh, on this issue. Uh, and two, it's that gun violence is a public health issue. It's not a partisan issue, and it shouldn't be. So, 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 so let me elaborate on that. When they're making cars safer, like after uh, Not Safe at Any Speed came out by Ralph Nader, um, great book, by the way. Um, after that book came out, people started realizing like it's a lot easier to change a couple of executive minds than hundreds of millions of people's behaviors and make roads safer, right? Uh, so what they did is they started advocating for public health policy, making steering columns collapsible, putting in airbags, making it so that there aren't knobs that would give you a lot of eye injuries if you were to get in a car accident, instituting physical speed barriers like traffic circles and different things like that that, don't, that automatically modify people's behavior and still allow people to drive but prevent a, lo I mean, a lot more of them from dying, right? 
That's what we're trying to do with guns. So, is, so that, is that background checks? Is that it's, it's closing loopholes? It's um, extremist protection orders for people that, that are domestic abusers. And the important note to take away from that is the people that are advocating for car safety are not pro-car or anti-car. They're pro-people not dying. And that's what I am. So you mentioned this uh, sort of rally or, or event where you were able to talk one-on-one -on -one with people who appeared to be, you know, shouting um, slurs and, and other things. Did you reach them? Yeah. So, we, so tell, tell us yeah. about that. So um, we realized that we agree, like, they went through a process. I'm actually writing a college essay on this right now. It's, it's called How to Talk to People That Want to Kill You. Um, <laughs> And what I realized is through the process, you can slowly, like, first you have to, I'll, I'll just give you guys, like, the beginner's guide if you ever want to talk to people that want to kill you. Uh, I don't suggest it. But uh, the way that I, like, have done it is, like, you get one individual from the group and talk to them for a couple of minutes and explain, like, your side. And then you have them slowly, di like, diffuse you into their group. Um, and as you get into that group, you explain, you, you simply listen. And you don't listen to respond. That's the important thing to remember. You listen to learn why they feel the way they do, right? And that's what I did. For 20 minutes, they all explained to me how they've grown up around guns, and I have too. My dad's a gun owner, and I've cleaned and used his gun multiple times. Um, I, I understand part of that culture, because my dad's former law enforcement, so I explained that to them. And then I, I listened to the other things that they talked about, like uh, about um, their guns, and why they feel the need to use them, and how they're part of their culture, and how they don't want to have their guns taken away. So after, after listening to learn, I simply, respond to each one, I address each one of the issues that they, at, that they ask about, and the first thing that I ask them is, are you a domestic abuser? Are you a terrorist, and are you a risk to yourself and others? And they all said, no, I'm like, okay, I'm not trying to take your guns away, period, right? Uh, because that's where an extremist protection order comes in. Extremist protection orders and red flag laws are laws that are not instituted at a federal level right now and should be. Um, they basically, for the, just as a case example at our school, what they could have done is they could have, it, they, the shooter at our school had the uh, FBI and law enforcement called on him 38 times, but our state didn't have extremist protection orders, so they couldn't have taken his guns away, right? Um, so what, the way extremist protection orders would have worked is they would, he would have been reported to police and the family and others that did report him, he would have shown up in the system and they essentially would have taken his guns away for 72 hours where, they would have, where he would have had the chance to argue in court why he's not a risk to himself and others through due process uh, to get those guns back. Um, and if, he, if it was found that he was a risk to himself and others, he wouldn't get those guns back, so he couldn't go out and commit those acts, right? Which likely, likely would have happened in, in that situation. Yeah, um, exactly. And so does, does that mean there is common ground? Oh, you, you found that there is common ground. Yeah, there, the, there is a lot of common ground between these different groups. The only thing that I uh, ended up realizing at the end, of, like, a, like a couple of days after our conversation, was that these people were Nazis that I was speaking to. Um, but they ended up crying and hugging us, so I don't know how to feel about that. Um, well, well, on the issue in question, there's common ground. Yeah, there may be other that, issues yeah. there is not. No, uh, no, yeah, right. other issues not at all. Um, um, but let's take a win yeah. where, where you can get it, right? Yeah. Um, the, the, but, the, yeah. but then, so what, what is preventing this kind of dialogue, this kind of discourse from happening so that yeah. not only can you agree that there's, there's common ground, but then you can actually work together to um, bring about this, this gun safety um, uh, yeah. regulation. It's the hundreds of millions of dollars that the NRA pours into elections to make sure our politicians don't speak about this issue and are able to sell more guns, period. That, that, like that's, what the NRA does is like, I mean, a, lot of their a lot of their revenue comes in from gun sales with partnerships that they have with different gun and bullet manufacturers. So when they say, like, let me just dissect one argument that they have. When they say the, the only thing to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, they are trying to sell you two guns, <laughs> right? When they say that you need a gun to defend yourself and your household, what they refuse to mention is the fact that oftentimes when burglars are breaking in, they aren't breaking in to kill you, they're just breaking in to steal stuff. And oftentimes they have a gun for self-protection in case the person in the household is armed. And a couple of studies have found that even having an, a firearm in your household puts you at significant, significantly more of a risk of dying if somebody is breaking in simply to steal stuff than if you were to use a baseball bat even. Because that person is using that gun in terms of self-protection. And if they see a gun, they're a lot more likely to shoot you. They don't talk about that. They don't talk about that seven-year-old girl that I just talked about. They don't mention the thousands of kids that are taken in, gun, in simple 
just instances around the country where a, a child gets a hold of a gun and is playing with it and accidentally shoots themselves. So it's purely a commercial system. interest yes. that's driving the other side of this agenda, this yes. question? Exactly, because there's a reason that every more developed country with the same rates, of, most more developed countries have the same rates of mental health issues as this country and the same rates of, as bullying as this country. We are not statistically significant in any aspect of those two demographics. What we are statistically significant in, though, is that we have more guns than people in this country and incredibly easy accessibility to them. And there's a reason why every more developed country in this country, or, or in the world, that has faced gun violence hasn't responded with more guns, and it's because it doesn't work. Um, the topic of media coverage, because part of your work is increasing conversation, um, maybe raising people's understandings of, of, of these issues, whether it's um, about the NRA or the commercialization of the gun industry or, or whatever. Um, but you also, I think, have, have suggested that the media attention span isn't long enough on, on certain topics so that you can actually get the discourse going. Yeah. So, you know, that, that what, what, why aren't they covering it more? Because we don't care. That's why. The media plays to one audience, and that's all of us. If we actually cared about these issues and stood up against them, the media is a reflection of our society. When they cover a, a plane crash for several weeks and focus on the issue and how to fix it, that proves that we as a society have decided that this issue is no longer acceptable and that we're not going to let people die in plane crashes, right? But when they cover an issue of gun violence, like the thousands of people that are murdered in cities across America and don't get the same amount of attention as the, the children that were murdered at my school do because they, they weren't murdered in school and they were murdered in a different zip code and have a different number of figures in their bank account, don't get covered the same. It, it, it's a reflection of our society. It's a reflection of who we actually value in this country and it's really sad because we should be valuing everybody no matter where they come from or who they are. You know, and part, with that media responsibility, like there's responsibility with me that comes with that because I am not, I personally and demographically am not the first type of person that's affected most by gun violence in this country. Right, here we, here we are, two, two white guys ha yeah. sitting up here having this conversation. I mean, if anything, more likely than not, the, the, the thing that we'd be most affected by is us committing suicide, um, demographically speaking. Um, but um, the people that are primarily affected by gun violence in America are the people that get the least amount of attention. That's young men of color in, in, in mainly lower income communities. And that's really, that's horrible. Because when we're talking about mental health in white communities, like we're constantly talking about that around gun violence, but you don't think that the children that walk to school every day and hear several gunshots a week or in their classroom and have to dive to the floor because they hear gunshots outside of their school coming from outside and not inside have to dive to the floor. Or the girl that I met in East Oakland that lost 20 friends to gun violence in the past five years and hears gunshots before she goes to sleep at least every other night, doesn't have some kind of mental health like PTSD or anything like that. That's incredibly offensive and disrespectful by writing off those people that have experienced so much violence compared to the rest of the country. And we have to acknowledge that. So, so what, what have you and your friends been doing to ensure that the community of activists represents everybody that's, that's affected? It, it's by making this movement as intersectional as possible and recognizing the fact of like, who's not on this stage right now? There, there isn't a transgender person on this stage, there isn't a person of color on this stage, but when we do, when I go out and do interviews, for example, I, I always try to include somebody from the local community because I understand that I don't know how Boston is affected by gun violence. But March for Our Lives Boston, you guys can stand up if you want. March for Our Lives Boston, who you guys, who make everything possible here. Um, they know how Boston is affected by gun violence. And it, it would be incredibly irresponsible and disrespectful from an organizational perspective and from a personal perspective to write off anybody else because of where they live or anything like that and act like they know, um, like act like I know how they are affected by gun violence. Because I can have sympathy for the people that are affected by gun violence here in Boston, but I can't have empathy because I don't know exactly how they're affected by gun violence. And the way we address that is by handing the microphone over to other people that have different experiences with gun violence and don't speak for those, those people with the understanding that each one of our voices needs to be at this table to create a solution for each one of those people, right? 
And that, that's what we do. And it's really hard because of the racism even within the media, which is also, I think, a reflection of our society. Just as an example, when we led school walkouts on March 14th and uh, April 20th, because of like uh, on the anniversary of Columbine on April 20th, um, when we led walkouts in my school and uh, schools across the country, schools like Parkland and schools on the north side of Chicago, just as an example, we get fully endorsed by their school district and they'd be like, oh my God, this is so great that these kids are practicing their First Amendment rights. Um, but what I noticed is when a school like Northwestern High School in Miami-Dade County, which is primarily a poor community of color, uh, is walking out because four kids were shot in the past week at their school a couple of months ago and two of them died uh, or, or in their community a couple of months ago. When they walk out, all, that, all the footage isn't on the ground. It's not asking them why they're going out and doing this. It's from a helicopter making it look like a violent protest. And then when they walk out, uh, like when they walk out on the south side where my, like, diff where my friends like Ariana Williams and others are from that we brought on the road to change with us, they explained how they, they were threatened with expulsion or suspension or even arrest when they walked out. And that's horrible. That is absolutely horrible. And we have to acknowledge as a society the fact that we, we can't accept that. We cannot accept that only one part of society will get accepted. Like we only accept one type of violence in this society. That's not okay. We have to accept all types of gun violence, no matter where they come from, and violence in general, because everybody's voice matters here, because everybody is a human being with their own story and their own family. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> by virtue of being out there for as many months as you have, it sounds like people have been coming forward and telling you their stories, their experiences, in a way that otherwise wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, a lot of, a few people, a lot of people, every well, event? Every event. Uh, I've, had, I've had multiple people come up to me and talk about their experience with gun violence and also how like because of PTSD that they've faced in their own community, which wasn't a mass shooting, for example. Um, but when I was in California in one community, uh, there was a student talking about how, how much violence they had faced and, and how they had essentially given up because he, he felt that society didn't care about him anymore. He felt ridden off and that because of essentially where he lived in his zip code that he didn't matter. And he talked about how he had made plans to kill himself and didn't, you know? And like, we don't hear those stories. We don't hear the stories of those kids. What do you do with those? We have to recognize that like, c communities are disproportionately affected by this that are underrepresented by this, right? Yeah. Um, and there's a responsibility that comes with us as an organization that came out of this to make sure everybody's voice is at that table and make sure that we don't write anybody off because everybody's voice matters. Maybe in that spirit, we'll take some questions from yeah. the cards that, uh, that have been provided um, from the audience. So um, first one is, how do you manage the violent threats that you've gotten from people, presumably from the far right? Um, it's not easy, um, but I recognize that if, if I'm constantly getting threatened, I'm doing something right. Um, if, if people are constantly letting me live rent free in their heads while also saying that my 15 minutes are up, I'm winning. Uh, the fact that I'm even here right now in March for Our Lives Boston is here working every single day to end gun violence in Boston and Massachusetts with all of our different chapters here means that we're winning. And, and that, that's what gives me hope. And the, and the other fact of the matter is if I get killed, they prove my point. Very somber in the thought. Um, let, let's, let's take this question next. Um, is, is advancing um, gun reform, as it's, as it's uh, put here, um, I know you, you have a particular way that you like to speak about the, the challenge that uh, it's about gun safety regulation or gun yeah. violence prevention. Yeah. Um, how tied is advancing that to whether the Democrats gain a majority or not? I mean, honestly, the thing that gives me hope is the fact that it, when we look back at movements in American history, whether it be the women's uh, suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, um, or the, the American Revolutionary War, or, or anything of that sort, we, we, don't, we don't immediately think of, when I say the civil rights movement, we don't immediately think of political parties, right? Because movements are bigger than political parties. Movements are about humanity and individuals coming together as a collective group to change something that should not be accepted anymore. And that's what gives me hope, right? 
I, I think that if everybody was to stand up for gun safety and realize that this is not a partisan issue, it would help them immediately, no matter what political party they stand with. Because if, if for example, the Republicans were able to stand up and say that, you know, we support <laughs> extremist protection orders and universal background checks and putting guns under the Consumer Protection Act, which they're not right now, by the way, uh, toy guns are actually regulated more for safety than actual guns. Um, and we believe that we are going to fund gun violence research so that we, ca we can actually stop kids from dying, not just in schools, but in their communities. That, that, would, that would help a lot. And, and probably thinking this is a right-left issue or actually doesn't help the overall discourse. Yeah, when, um, when, when we're talking about public health, there are, no good, there are no good guys, there are no bad guys. There is one issue that we have to work together to solve. The time that change comes in any society is when the people stop pointing fingers at each other and point fingers at the issue and solve that issue and go after the sources of that evil and violence, not each other. Um, this next question is specifically about improving school safety. Mm -hmm. What can be done at that level uh, versus changing society as a whole? Absolutely, we can do a lot to improve school safety and there's groups that work in our own community that work to improve that, like Max Schachter has a great organization. Um, Max Schachter, his son is Alex Schachter, he was killed in the shooting and he created uh, 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 an organization for safer schools that he lobbies with and, and things that schools can do in general is like improve don't incarcerate more children and specifically young people of color you know don't over policing our schools is not going to end violence because what happens in our schools is a, ref, a, a reflection of what's happening in our community in my opinion um, and if we're able to actually train teachers on what the warning signs of these individuals are and make them recognize like like the warning signs that the shooter at our school had and actually create a system where right now like a, a really big issue that n not many people are talking about is the fact that violent crimes and crime in general in schools are underreported by teachers because their, their principals don't want it to reflect poorly on them and we need to realize that that is a major issue where we need third parties to come in and do independent evaluations of schools and their safety um, and we need to create federal funding for that which we have somewhat but the the bill that was passed only gives a, I think a Last time I checked, like two thousand dollars per twenty-six thousand high schools in America, and that, that's not enough to really do anything. If we actually want to make schools safer, we have to start off by making all of our communities safer, in my opinion, and also implementing more social workers at our schools. Because ra raise your hand if you're in high school right now. Raise your hand if you think guidance counselors are bullshit by guidance counselors. <laughs> not a single hand went down because guidance counselors are not what they're called. Guidance counselors are people that make schedules for students. At my school, we had 3,300 students. We had 12 guidance counselors. When, when I'm applying to college and I have to get a letter of recommendation from my guidance counselor that I've only met five times to create my schedule, I think, what, what does that have to do with anything? Seriously, because ask any high school or student, they'll tell you guidance counselors are the, guidance counselors are the worst marketed thing on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> They are not counselors. They are people that make your schedule and tell you that you need to go to college and that's it. They aren't people that you can go to like, oh my God, like that when you feel sad that you really need help. Those people are our teachers that are vastly underpaid and not a lot of which aren't like given the qual proper training or qualifications to deal with students' mental health issues that they face in their communities. Like that's unacceptable. And the way that we shift that perception in our schools is by implementing social workers and like having students having students do check-ins with somebody that they're actually assigned to where like every 30 students for example will have one person that will be there for them that will stay with them throughout their four years of high school and know what their family situation is know what's going on in their schools and want them to succeed and not just push them through a system because society tells them to because that's not okay my experience growing up which wasn't yesterday or today um, uh, was of you know a guidance counselor who was trying to work out what what are you interested in what are you good at what subjects are you exactly. are you um, prone to and then what careers would that open it up and, itself up for and also what they're what, the other thing that they're thinking about is like guidance counselors won't tell you this and a lot of schools won't either but what politicians do is they think they try implementing policies where students have to take uh, classes not based off what they're interested in but what will make the most for textbook companies that fund congressional candidates campaigns that's hundreds of millions of dollars right there, even billions. It's a billion dollar industry that isn't focused on students' education. It's focused on getting morally corrupt leaders elected again and again while our students' education in America falls behind every more developed country. 
in the process. And are you thinking of that as really a system analysis because of the behavior that it incents? I assume yeah. there are really good people who are just trying to do the best they can without yeah. you know, all of the resources exactly. they need to. to and and yeah. like, that's what we have to recognize. The fact that um, we have to recognize that like, this issue of gun violence and like, how the NRA causes this effect to happen isn't just around gun violence, it's around every issue in the United States, from immigration and private prison industries that, are, that make millions and billions of dollars off of building more and more prisons based off of third graders' reading levels, right? That don't wanna rehabilitate these people and keep them incarcerated because they make millions and millions, actually billions of dollars a year off of it, and incarcerate 12,000 young children that are at the border separated from their families. One of those companies is known as Geo Group, by the way. Um, they make money off of that and they fund congressional campaigns to keep that going. And the only way that we're ever gonna change that is by voting those morally corrupt leaders that are not just Democrats or Republicans, but are simply just corrupt as hell out of office and electing morally just leaders that care about their communities and not their special interests. So we've certainly been talking about the gun safety piece yeah. of this. Um, the other two pieces of the organizations and movements that you are, have started with your friends are part of really speaks to me to um, voter registration um, and also to youth political action. Can you talk about how important those are to the future of these issues more generally? You're, you're giving us a critique of society as a whole, which I think is, yeah. is great because these issues don't stand alone. Um, but you know, I, I'd like to hear what your, your thoughts are on the importance of voter registration and youth political action in general. First off, voter registration shouldn't exist. There are many examples of democracies that don't have voter registration. And the actual thing is here, when we talk about voter registration and people that wanna push that, if you wanna push voter ID laws that make it so that Native Americans can't vote, you're not, you're not, you're anti-democracy. You are purely anti-democracy and anti-people because that is not okay. There, there are many ways to go about having automatic voter registration that we could easily get that would maintain the security of our elections, but actually enable every American to go out and vote. We can't talk about like elections if we don't talk about the 21% of otherwise eligible African Americans in Florida that can't vote right now because of a previous nonviolent conviction, right? That, that's modern day Jim Crow, in my opinion. That's what it is. It's mass incarceration of people of color in a swing state so that they can suppress the vote and make sure that it constantly goes one way as much as possible. So even improving voter registration is only yeah. fixing what you consider is already a broken system yeah. already. And, but we have to register and vote to change that system together, to overcome that systematic oppression and create an America that it says it, uh, that it is on paper and not what it says it is in a congressional candidate's pocketbook or election campaign fund. right? How, how does this topic become common ground with people on, um, on the right if they're the opposite uh, no, part it, of the spectrum? It's pointing out that Democrats and Republicans and anybody that's running for Congress at this point, a lot of them are owned by corporations that don't care about their, they see, we need to get congressional candidates that are public servants and not, a, that are public servants and not politicians. We need to get congressional candidates that see their constituents as constituents and people and not customers, right? And the, the way that we go about that is by showing people how they're systemically oppressed. When, when, when we're talking about like, what's going on in this country, we have, to, we have to talk about the fact that when Lockheed Martin goes out there and politically engineers a project like the F-35 that gets billions of dollars over budget and can basically flops, because it's a project that was inevitably doomed for failure and politically engineered perfectly, where they have a single part of the F-35 made in like strategic congressional districts. We have to realize that that is not in the best interest of the American public, that's in the best interest of one company. And that has gone massively over debt, just as an example. And we have to just, we have to realize that moral corruption does not see party lines. Moral corruption sees you not voting. On, on either side on either of side. any issue. Yeah. Um, let's let's com come back to the, the, the youth political action yeah. piece of this because I, I don't think you gave, gave yeah. that enough um, uh, uh, airtime. I think what we have to recognize is that it's not going to be any, any single one individual that comes and saves us. As I said earlier, it's going to be yourself that saves you. Because nobody, in all honesty, it, in America right now, and especially with our politics as it is on the Hill, nobody cares about you except you. But we can change that by you voting. 
and running for office to make that change for you and your friends. You know, and what I hope to create is a generational shift where it's not just March for Our Lives Sweden that talks about getting low voter turnout when it's at 87%, right? That should be America. Everybody should be going out and voting because voting is the best form of dissent and it's the most patriotic thing you can do. It's the best thing you can do to make this country better. And there's a reason why the framers of the Constitution gave us two years to throw everybody out of the House of Representatives. And it's so we can do exactly what we're doing right now. Um, this is a pretty open question. What's next for March for Our Lives? So the way that I think about it is after, after we end gun violence, because we will. We will by each one of us standing up and working together to solve this issue and recognizing what's actually driving it, which is greed and moral corruption of our elected officials. And the only way we can fix it is by young people standing up, voting, and always voting. Not just in one election, not just for one person, but for moral justice and to end corruption with your vote. The way I think about it is uh, the March on Washington was about um, jobs, right, in the civil rights movement. But it, it became about something so much bigger. It became about race. It became about economic opportunity and so many other things. The way I think about March for Our Lives is embodying that movement where we create a, a young generation that is the first generation to be the largest youth voter turnout in American history in this non-presidential midterm to make politicians realize, wow, I actually have to give a shit about young people, <laughs> right? And if we're able to do that, that means so many things for my generation because what it gives me hope is when people constantly just crap on my generation, which is not uncommon and it's incredibly offensive and I would argue ageist. Um, when that happens, when every generation that has come before us, every generation that has faced historically the most amount of discrimination because of their age, because it's believed that they're, like, the, just as an example, uh, the one that sticks out the most in my mind is a generation that, set, that was believed to have been too babied by their moms. Uh, weren't going to do anything with their lives, were lazy, read comic books too much, and were never going to do anything with their lives. You know what that generation was? The greatest generation that went out and saved us in World War II and saved the world. Generations that are systemically oppressed are always the generations that save the world, and that's what gives me hope. There's probably not an age limit on being a supporter of this movement. No, there either. isn't. There's no age limit when it comes, there's no upper age limit when it comes to voting, right? So you have to go out and make sure that you're voting for those that can't. And it's, about, it's not about electing Democrats or Republicans, it's about electing morally just leaders that represent us and care about children dying in their communities. That don't just care about children dying from bullets inside of their school, but care about children dying from bullets outside of their school too. Right? Um, this next question takes us back to the more personal thoughts. Um, it asks, how much have you grown since the February 14th? Oh my god. Uh, an unbelievable amount. Um, I, like, there's this graph that I always think of that talks about like the, how the amount of knowledge that you think you have like, is, is basically like, uh, the more that you think you know, the less you actually know, and the more you know, the more you realize how little you know. And like, that's what, like, that is so true. Because the more you realize that you don't know, the more that you're actually learning. And like, that, that's what I've seen a lot. Uh, I've learned that a couple of the things, the two things that I have been the most useful, that the two simplest things, that have been the hardest, but the, the most valuable for me to learn along this process that I never would have learned in school, is one, how to listen, not to respond, but to learn. And two, how understanding the difference between sympathy and empathy, which is what I learned when I spent Father's Day with Michael Brown's dad uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, and went to the place where his son was shot and killed by a police officer. So, so tell us what you mean by the difference between sympathy and empathy then. So essentially, I, 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 as, a, as a cisgender white male, I don't know what it's like to be uh, discriminated against by police, for example. Uh, but I can have sympathy for those individuals and be an ally with those people. Uh, I, I am not a transgender person, but I, I do know a lot of people that are in the trans community and in the LGBTQ plus uh, community and I can be an ally with those people and support them in whatever endeavor they encounter. But I can't know what they've lived through. And it's, the, it's that understanding that I can support people but I never can speak for individuals with different experiences. And that's the most valuable thing. And that can be one of the hardest things to learn. And also admitting when you don't know. Uh, that, that's a really, that is the most valuable thing you will ever learn is how, how to admit when you don't know something and to learn from it. And not just admit and give up that you don't know about it, but go out there and learn what it actually is and how you can fix it. Um, 
how do you think librarians can help with raising awareness <laughs> with gun violence protection? I, I didn't write this one, I swear. So. Uh, uh, There, there's a like for example, there's a lot of books out there that like um, that talk about. Um, here, let me like. Um, there are a couple I wasn't books. expecting this would be the the question that stumped you, by the way. But uh. no, like it's very hard because like librarians can be the most valuable asset in ending gun violence um, in America. And the way, the reason for that is because there's so many movements that are held in books and information that were not taught in our schools. I didn't learn what the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was but until I met John Lewis. And I got, I got a perfect score on my AP US History exam and didn't know that, right? We are, we are not, we are, the way that we are taught history in our schools is taught not to inspire us, but to make us learn from the past. But we have to realize and take inspiration from those people and realize that when Alexander, came, when Alexander Hamilton came here, for example, uh, he was essentially, he was in a very similar situation to what hundreds of thousands of Puerto Rican um, people that are coming to the mainland the United States now, they're not immigrants, I want to clarify that, they're American citizens. Um, because a lot of people seem to, like, especially in the media, sorry, that just really bothers me. Yeah, no, um, I, I get it. <laughs> um, the people that, are, fl that ha are fleeing from Hurricane Maria and the United, the, the United States' horrible response to that, uh, when they're coming to the United States, and Donald Trump says things like they're not giving us their best. Realize, the thing that makes America special is that nobody has ever given us their best. This is the place where people come and prove people wrong and say, look at what I'm doing now. Alexander Hamilton, yeah, it's awesome. Um, Alexander Hamilton came here at the age of 17 fleeing a hurricane too. And then he went on to found the United States Treasury and the, one of the biggest economies in the world as a young person. And you know why he was successful? Because he didn't let any other older person or anybody else say that you can't do that. Because this is America and you can do anything you want. It's not easy though, but you can. Um, and we're, we'll just take a couple more and then yeah. we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, what one thing do you think individuals can do to make the biggest difference in the political climate? Get five people to vote. That's it, period. I learned about this on the uh, Obama campaign from like some of the volunteers that had worked on it in 08 and 2012. And one system that they had, and, and like the, it, it's not just like Democrats or de Republicans that benefit from this. It's 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 democracy that benefits from this. Uh, they came up with a system called like the system of five. And they, when people wanted to volunteer for them, even if they had an hour, they would say, "It's great that you want to do all this work and be a national organizer for us, but we need you to do the most like the simplest thing that will have the largest impact, and that's get." Go out and find five people that weren't going to vote and make them vote. And that is how you can multiply the effect that you and Americans have on our democracy to elect morally just leaders that represent us and not special interests. I'm going to blend something we talked about earlier with this next question. You talked about um, the importance of just listening yeah. um, to learn, uh, to understand. Um, if you were to meet our current president, um, what would you emphasize in that interaction? I would talk about um, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about. Um, I, I would just emphasize that we need to fund research into this issue. You know, no matter what, the the CDC. We've repealed the Dickey Amendment, which basically said that uh, grants from the CDC, the NIH, the NIJ, and uh, different, non, uh, different governmental organizations that fund research uh, couldn't do research into gun violence prevention that would advocate for any form of gun control whatsoever. I simply want research because honestly, in my, in my personal view, if arming teachers worked, I would be all for it. You know, if arming everybody worked and putting gun vending machines, which some of the people I've talked to on every street corner would work, I would be all for it, but it doesn't. But we need, to realize, we need to realize that the thing that we need more than anything here is we need to fund the CDC, we, we, need, to, we need to fund the CDC, the NIH, and the NIJ, and the National Science uh, uh, Foundation, no, uh, yeah, the National Science Foundation, so that they can actually do research into these issues so we can have data-based solutions that don't, 
that don't just fix this for one community, but fix this for all communities and recognize that violence anywhere is something that is solvable and preventable that we don't need to incarcerate millions of Americans for and can easily prevent because violence is a disease that we will, that we can and will cure. But the best cure to start off with that is a vote. Um, <clears throat> if people want to get involved locally, um, I think you yeah. previewed what you want to say, um, but uh, <laughs> let, let's give you an opportunity to give a shout out to our, our local, our local yeah. team. So if you guys want to get, get involved uh, locally, you can just like raise your hand and March for Lives. Boston can come and like get your information and hand you a card. Um, but they'll also be out there like around me um, later on. So if, if you guys are interested in that, um, just let them know. They're all up front pretty much. Could you guys stand up so people can see? Also, give them a round of applause, like, seriously. So, David, my final question for you is, what's next for you? Um, realizing that violence isn't, like, violence in the United States is not an issue. The United States doesn't... Like, guns don't just have a role in violence in the United States that are produ guns produced in the United States don't just have a role in violence here. Guns have a massive role in violence caused in other countries where, for example, we, we allow millions of guns, like thousands and thousands of guns to be trafficked into Mexico every year. And then when people are fleeing violence that is brought on by those guns, because Mexico has incredibly tight gun laws, but because we allow that trafficking, People are trying to flee that violence as refugees and running away from violent criminal gangs in Central America and South America and fleeing to the one place that they feel safe, the United States. And then when they come here, we call them illegal immigrants when really they're just not trying to die by violence that we have a, a major role in, you know? And that's not okay. And also, uh, what's next is getting some laws passed at a federal level. We've seen more laws pretty much in the past eight months passed than ever before at a state level for gun, uh, for gun laws that'll, that protect the Second Amendment, but protect the right for you not to be affected by gun violence. Because as Americans, we have a right to bear arms, but we have a right to live, yeah. right? Um, that's an amazing note to end on, the right to live. Yeah, make sure you get five people to vote though, please. <laughs> Uh, please join me in thanking my guests as we talk through all of these issues tonight.